So welcome everyone to the latest Trees Around the Globe research, uh, student research campaign webinar. This is the State of Trees, July 2023, looking at land cover through the historic eyes of Landsat satellites, remote sensing, and the interactive do-it-yourself handheld spectrometer tool, Stella, which I know we teased you with at the end of last month's webinar. So we have uh, Mike Taylor is here with us and he is the Stella guru um, at NASA and Landsat with the Landsat mission. And he's gonna talk all about Stella and, and what it can do and just everything about it. And then uh, our own Peter Nelson will then follow up on you know, how we can tie it into you know, the campaign and what we're doing and some of the things that he's been doing uh, looking at data. So um, as you know, um, we like to start off with different things in the webinar. And here's a nice little quote that I found from a guy named Kevin Gallagher, the United States Geological Survey Associate Director for Core Science Systems at one point. He said, many people have no idea how earth imagery has improved their daily lives as it has become integrated into modern technologies. Like GPS and weather data, information from Landsat is woven into the fabric of our economy and society. So as you know, the Landsat series of satellites and Landsat missions have been around for over 50 years. And you know, they are just have provided such groundbreaking, groundbreaking um, imagery about our planet and looking at change over time. So with that said, uh, we have today's agenda. Uh, this is the introduction. I'll be talking briefly with a couple slides about our current NASA Moon Trees quest. And I'm missing a T there, sorry, not understand why, but. And then we had the featured presentation and then we saw some Q and A uh, with this. Um, so this is gonna be a really fun webinar today. And um, I've heard Mike talk about um, the Stella instrument often and it's a really, really amazing tool and it's getting you know, globally known. So it's such an awesome tool. All right, so with the campaign, uh, I always pop on the metrics and if I uh, could bring your attention down to year five, which we're in now, which we began on, the 1st of October of 2022, the measurements for tree heights, land cover, and green up, green down, or greenings are coming in fast and furious. We have over 30,600 measurements since then from over 9,100 global sites. And if you add up everything for the life of the campaign so far, which as you know, began when I set to launch on the 15th of September, 2018, with these three uh, specific measurements, tree height, land cover, and greenings, essentially four with green up, green down, we have over 155,000 observations from over 52,000 global sites. We've had uh, multiple webinars, as you know, um, uh, participants from 61 countries, and we have a bunch of blogs that are part of it. That's more than six blogs, by the way, at the bottom right. I'm not sure where the number went. My numbers and letters are disappearing, strange. All right. so. A little bit about the quest. Um, and as you know, this is a basically a regional quest in the United States because this is the, where the majority of the moon, NASA uh, moon trees or the Apollo 14 moon trees are located. But this quest began on the 21st of June, 2023, and it runs for three months until the 21st of September, 2023. And I can, I'll pop that uh, link, that URL in the chat uh, in a bit. But a couple of cool things about this is that with this quest, you know, we have a couple things that, you know, that we're focusing on. And I mentioned this last one, but I just want to remind people about this. Since this is a regional webinar, and this doesn't mean that you have to live in the United States to do this. I know that a lot of you are coming from outside of the United States to the Globe Annual Meeting next week in Denver, Colorado. And in that area, there are different types of species related to the NASA moon trees. Douglas fir, uh, potentially loblolly pine, sweet gum, sycamore, and giant sequoia. These regions and states that we focus on uh, for, this, for this quest uh, are basically what's called a, a, using the, the geofencing tool on GLOBE where you know, we look at the natural uh, range of these of these tree species and we focus this for the quest. So with this two part challenge, we have uh, one goal is to take tree height observations using the NASA Globe Observer of the type of trees that are part of the 
that were part that were flown on Apollo 14. Now I have to do have a little disclaimer here is that on Apollo 14, Douglas fir, loblolly pine, sweet gum, and sycamore were flown on board. We also flew coast redwood tree seeds on board, but the Artemis mission, who you heard from a lot, you know, several uh, uh, webinars ago, the Artemis mission flew those four, but instead of the coast redwood, which has a limited geographical distribution, they replaced that with giant sequoia, basically the same family, but different species. So with the quest, we're looking for people to find Douglas fir, loblolly pine, sweet gum, sycamore, and coast redwood. Now, if you are using the app and you're within 25 miles of an Apollo, an actual Apollo 14 moon tree that has been planted, and of course, survived and is accessible to the public, okay, the app will pop up and say, hey, here is the latitude and longitude. Here is some information about this Apollo 14 tree that you're near. And here is uh, the address of where the tree is located. If you can safely go find it and take a tree height observation. And we'd have multiple, we've had multiple ones uh, you know, happen. We've had multiple ones uh, found. So here are some examples of some of the moon trees. Now, the top three are the species. These aren't actual Apollo 14 moon trees, but these are, these are species. So this fits that objective or that goal number one here, where uh, one is in Eden, Maryland. That's actually one that I found, and it's at a farmhouse of a friend of mine. It was his, grand, it's, it was his grandmother's farmhouse that he now lives, but it was built in the 1700s. But there is a sycamore tree there, American sycamore, that I measured at 39.34 meters. So that's a very tall one. And he's looking into the record books that it may be the second tallest and largest American sycamore tree in the state of Maryland, but that hasn't been uh, proven yet. And then also we had, had one from uh, Waterloo, Iowa, a sweet gum tree that was measured. And then in Carlsbad, California, a Douglas fir tree. But what's really cool here, are these two images on the bottom, and one is a coast redwood tree in Monterey, California, and that height was measured at 19.83 meters. And this is an actual Apollo 14 moon tree. So this was planted in the mid 1970s. And then in Berkeley, California, another coast redwood, which is actually Apollo 14 moon tree measured at a very tall 33.99 meters. So this is, these are just some examples. And there's been a bunch of moon trees, the Apollo 14 moon trees and moon tree species that have been measured and put into the into the uh, GLOBE database using the NASA GLOBE Observer Trees tool. And if you happen to measure a species of tree, of moon tree, or, the, or an actual Apollo 14 moon tree, as you know, when you submit, right before you submit a tree height observation with the app, there's a comment box. And we ask you to just put in there hashtag moon tree. So we know when we look at the database, we can do a search for moon tree and see exactly where all these moon trees are coming from. I wanna show you this brief video, and you may have seen this. This was highlighted by the Artemis mission as well as the NASA Earth Instagram pages. And it's an Instagram reel that we created as an introduction to the Moon Trees Quest. This went out when the Moon Trees Quest began on the 21st of June. So let me go ahead and play this. It's only about a minute long, but it's very cool. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. My name is Dave Williams, and I'm a planetary scientist at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Stuart Rusa, uh, back when he was in high school, um, for a summer job, he started working in the U.S. Forest Service and uh, eventually became a, a smoke jumper, which is these guys who jump out of airplanes into forest fires that are remote and can't be reached any other way. So when he was chosen for Apollo 14, he, uh, he talked to people at the Forest Service and they came up with this idea to bring tree seeds uh, with him in his personal kit. Circled the moon, um, brought the seeds back to Earth, and then the Forest Service germinated them, and then the seeds were planted all over the United States uh, for the bicentennial. So the status of the trees now, a lot of them are unknown. People send me a lot of information, they send me pictures. Right now, we've located about 70 trees that are alive. So one of the objectives here of this, of the NASA Moon Trees Quest is that we want to further document exactly where these trees are, what the health of these trees are, how tall they are, and basically if they are still accessible. 
So um, that's one of the, the great things about this quest is that we have people checking these out for NASA and for GLOBE and bringing, bringing great data into the GLOBE database that, uh, that folks can use. So what I did was with this uh, sycamore tree, I went and, and this is a lot going on here. I'm not going to go through all this, but I went and I, I, I used some calculations that scientists use to, uh, you know, to estimate basically how old the tree is and how much carbon has been stored by the tree over the lifetime of the tree. And sorry about all the squiggly red marks, but the, the word doesn't really like that. And I didn't go and uh, do the spell check before I, I copied this page, but um, you know, the size of this tree is massive. If, if this is one, once again, at 39.34 meters and you know, doing these calculations, you know, we, it was an estimated that it has brought in and basically stored over 125,000 pounds of carbon over the lifetime and the estimated tree age, which was, which was, I, I used equations specifically for American sycamore that it, it came out to the tree is about 254.4 years old. So that's a very old tree. So, uh, but yeah, these are the, some equations that, that, that scientists use to, uh, to estimate uh, basically uh, carbon sequestration in trees over the lifetime of the tree, and then also an estimated age. And once again, these are, these calculations are not linear, just estimates. Um, they're not, you know, it's not, probably not exactly 254.4 years old. It's an estimate um, based upon the numbers that we plug into to, to this. So um, just want to showcase that. So with that said, um, uh, one last slide before we go to feature presentation. And Peter Nelson, I, wanna, um, I want to, uh, you to uh, you know, uh, highlight this again because people, uh, there are different people on the webinar today than there were last month. So if you could say a, a few uh, words about this slide, please. Glad to do that, Brian. Um, and this really goes into what we're doing here with the GLOBE program and, um, and our Trees Around the Globe student research campaign. Trees have been a foundational piece that have been trying, uh, people have been trying to monitor from space since the beginning. Um, and I was really honored to be able to be part of this 50th anniversary of the EROS Data Center. And so EROS is, um, is an acronym for the Earth Research Observation um, Science Center. Um, and, and that's a place in, located in the middle of the United States where all of this satellite imagery um, that we've been talking about, uh, in particular, the, the anything related to land processes, are stored at and um, and I was interviewed for their podcast um, about two weeks ago now um, in celebration of the generational science that we're doing here, not only in the GLOBE program and the education piece, but also the science. How do we actually um, archive and keep the data that we're collecting today relevant for the future. So I talk about that in this 20 minute um, uh, uh, podcast and I'd, I'd love to have everybody here, you know, use this as a way of thinking about what you're doing and the value of it, um, not only for today, but also for the future generations. I mean, Brian just showed some um, examples of how old a tree is and, um, and he highlights how those are estimates. And those are estimates because we can't measure all the 4 billion trees around the world. Um, and so how we do that goes back to our, our science and how we manage our data. And the GLOBE program is a great place to be able to practice this. And so um, I, I was really honored to be part of this 50th um, celebration of, um, of, of this Eros Data Center that has been archiving this data for a long, really long time. And it's really important to me because um, my dad was actually um, one of the original foresters on the Landsat program in 1972. And so he was there part of that whole moon trees piece of things because he was trying to map out where the Coast Redwoods were or where the Douglas fir were or where the sycamore trees were at that time. And um, and so to me, these are questions that we've been asking for a really long time. And um, and to see yourself as, as, as part of this long lived science that forestry and trees represent is just a really wonderful thing. So I encourage everybody to use this podcast as a, as a way of situating what we're doing in the life of a tree 
those things that tend to outlive a human in in many cases. Um, and so I'm really honored and, and excited as a Globe partner that not only do we have uh, moon trees at our Oregon State University campus where we have our partnership, um, but we have this connection to Stuart Rosa actually. And he was here in Oregon um, as, as, as a smoke jumper. And so we not only have an original moon tree um, seedling that has been planted, but we also have a uh, second generation that has come from the cones from that first generation tree that was planted. So, you know, this generational aspect of what we're doing um, with trees as our example and, um, and something that tells us about the past and tells us about the future is really what I talk about in this um, podcast. And so instead of giving you 20 minutes here of me continuing to talk about this, go listen to some more of me um, uh, talk about what we're doing here in the GLOBE program. Thanks, Brian. All right, thanks, Peter. And I'll pop those in the chat um, and when I, uh, when you guys are uh, presenting. Um, so with that said, we're gonna have today's feature presentation and this is gonna be all about the Stella do-it-yourself handheld spectrometer tool. And our first speaker is uh, the Stella guru, as I mentioned earlier, Michael Taylor, um, outreach scientist with the Landsat mission in the Earth Science Division at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. That's in Greenbelt, Maryland in the United States. And then uh, Peter will come back on and he'll talk about how we can apply some of this, these things that, that Mike is talking about with Stella and how Peter has used Stella as well in, in his work and research. So I'm gonna stop sharing now, Mike, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, just try and share my screen here. Okay, uh, there we go. Can you all see my screen? Yep, looks good. Just needs to be in presenter mode. Looks, it looks lovely. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep it on this particular mode. Okay. For PowerPoint. Cool. All good. Okay. All right. Uh, so my name is Mike Taylor. As Brian said, uh, I've been with uh, NASA for about 15 years, and uh, I got uh, handed the Stella project in its infancy, uh, probably about two years ago, and uh, have been leading the team ever since. The Stella uh, do-it-yourself handheld spectrometer uh, was created by Paul Mural. Uh, he's a uh, CubeSat engineer uh, and a heck of a nice guy. Um, then we have our lead scientist, Dr. Petya Campbell, uh, and our uh, cow valve guy, uh, Jesse Barber, and Ross Walter, who is our programmer and visualizer. He created this little rotating visualization that you're seeing here of the Stella and uh, the data viewer, which we'll see in a minute. Okay, uh, so Stella's mission, I'm not gonna read this verbatim, but basically we're trying to democratize instrumentation and in situ data. Uh, so, you know, the spectrometers generally cost an arm and a leg and each one of these spectrometers costs about 200 bucks. And we've been doing some cow vow on them for probably about the last year now. Uh, we've also, we're also doing uh, field calibration on them currently, uh, and every, the numbers are looking real good. And Stella is a, uh, is a nice Landsat analog here, so you can see some of the overlap. Uh, obviously, this isn't the best graphic. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, some overlap with the, uh, with the Landsat uh, satellites here. And so you can see we cover, you know, quite a wide, uh, wide range of the uh, bands that's, uh, that Landsat does. So we can go ahead and, you know, uh, sort of uh, not validate necessarily, but, you know, verify, you know, that, you know, what Landsat's seeing and what we're seeing are relatively the same thing, okay? So uh, Stella's potential, basically to offer new science uh, tools and such. Uh, so Stella is very modular. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, putting on things to make it, uh, and what I like to call is sort of like your own uh, personal tricorder, if you will, you know, even though that's copyrighted. Uh, the, uh, so that uh, basically like a farmer might, you know, want a soil probe on there. And so we might be able to do that. Uh, someone, uh, they're looking at water quality. So we might be able to do that as well by popping the UV sensor on here. So this is sort of a nice base, a nice starting point for, you know, doing a whole bunch of other different fun science. I know some people want to look at it through a telescope. You know, they want to do VRDF, they want to go underneath of uh, canopy and all that sort of stuff and do all these uh, various different things with the Stella uh, because it is a uh, 
wonderful modular scientifically you know viable tool okay uh the, and uh so we have a few different versions of the stella so we have the stella q which is solderless uh and basically it's uh, very easy to put together and we'll give you again you know step by step how to build it you know the parts list uh how to create your own and then how to collect your data and then eventually how to analyze your data which i'll show you in just a minute we have the stella one point well the 1.0 has actually been uh archived and now we have the 1.1 1 .1, uh which is uh has a better processor on there uh and uh it's uh it's also got the option for a GPS and a LIDAR, okay? So we can get to surface reflectance real easily with that, okay? Uh, so here's the Stella Q. So we give you the uh, nice little uh, PDFs that you can print out and all that, and you can basically just match up the, the parts to where they go, connect, and then you're ready to go, ready to rock and roll with your Stella Q. Stella 1.0, and the 1.1 1 .1 looks quite similar to this. Sorry, I clicked the button. Uh, and again, we give you the parts, how to put it together, all the fun stuff, programming, and so on and so forth, so that you can build your own and start collecting your own data. This is still a 2.0, can strap to your phone, okay? It's got, it's Bluetooth ready. We're looking eventually at developing a nice little app for it, okay? Uh, and again, we're trying to keep costs low, so that's why you can see that there's some rubber bands going across there. Uh, and both the Stella 1.1 and Stella 2.0 are drone ready. There's a little battery that you can tuck in there and you can barely see the battery up in the uh, PowerPoint here, but uh, altogether it weighs about 100 to about 180 grams. Okay, and we actually have uh, a lady we've been working with uh, down in Virginia named Paige Williams. She's actually been flying these on quadcopters and is at her students building. building. So again, uh, Paul being the uh, type of engineer and awesome guy that he is, he is very fastidious as far as, you know, putting out as much documentation as you could possibly want for, for these things. Uh, and if that's not enough, we also have a uh, basically a GitHub forum so that you can ask your questions. Okay, uh, so you can go there and basically can if you have ideas, questions, so on and so forth, you want to do something different with the Stella, that's where you go. And I'll go to that in a minute. And then we have the data viewer where you can actually connect your device up and see the real time data come in, or you can pop out the SD chip, plug it in and do a bit of fun data analysis. Okay, and I'll show you that in just a second. And here again, here's the open source form. You have to excuse me, this is a, uh, a slightly older uh, PowerPoint for uh for the stella i haven't had quite a chance to update it yet because i've been extremely busy <laughs> uh and uh i think we'll end that powerpoint there and i will show you some of the live stuff that i have hooked up um, let me okay new share okay and we'll go to this desktop here okay can you see the new desktop i assume that you can we see a purple desktop. A purple desktop. Okay. Oh, well, it looks purple. Oh, I see. I see why. Okay, because I didn't click share on the bottom button. I'm sorry. Uh, how about now? Better. Yeah. All yeah. right. Sweet. Okay. So this is the uh, the GitHub form again, where you can ask questions. So we have like debugging issues. Uh, you know the applications, what you can do with it. So we're looking to beef this up quite a bit, and you can see people have already started asking some questions and all that uh, about it. The Stella, you know, if you have any ideas again about you know adding some sort of baffle or something like that, you know, we're always looking for new uh, fun things to do with it, okay, and to learn from each other. Uh, so uh, let's see. Here's the uh, I'm going to show you how to connect your Stella. So basically, you turn your Stella on, then you plug it in, okay, and then you go to connect the device, and you'll see a little device connection up there, and this is actually my live Stella now, just reading different things. And I have quite a bit of blue going on here. I can go ahead and get rid of that screen and pop on just the raw data if I want to. If, if I don't want the, the raw data, I can go ahead and X out the visible or the 
infrared and just get one or the other. Okay. Uh, you can also, you know, turn down some of the uh, irradiance measurements going there. So you can actually see what's going on. And yeah, you have a bunch of different fun things. And if you don't want to need to know how to use it, we have the nice little helper up at the top there. Okay. All right. And then if you actually want to analyze the data, we have uh, this particular uh, screen on the data viewer. Okay, so this is data I collected. Um, this was at NSTA. They had a nice atrium there and it was full sun. And I just sort of, uh, you know, went around the uh, uh, nice semicircle of vegetation. And so you're seeing my measurements as I was going along over time. Okay. And then if you take a look at the NDVA, NDVI data, you can actually really see, uh, you know, me going across where, you know, heavy vegetation was and then start, there's starting gaps down in here where it's hitting, you know, ground and bare soil and all that. And then again, dense vegetation going across over time. And we got uh, the reflectance coming in, We're looking at NIRV and all that. Okay. Uh, and a bunch of fun other like vegetation indices. Okay. And the way we do that uh, is uh, basically there's a, a we sort of have a how-to on the forum and it's going to be coming up on the website itself on how to uh, actually do the uh, field calibrations with these. So for field calibrations, again, since we're trying to keep the cost low, uh, we're not using um, your standard spectral line because it'd be, it's you know cost prohibitive. So we're trying to use uh, polystyrene foam instead. Okay, now let me turn off the sharing screen. And Stop sharing. There we go. All right. So now you get to look at my face, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so that's one of the fun things that we're doing. So you so basically, you get the height, you take the measurement and of your polystyrene, and then you take the measurement of your object. And the polystyrene measurement is your calibration batch. And then the, the, the batch that you take your measurement with is uh, what you're going to use and to get to the surface reflectance of that batch. Okay, and so here's the uh, actual Stella Q that I mentioned. Okay, we have the 1.1 uh, here that I have. Okay, and you can see the LIDAR is mounted right in between the sensors here. So if we go down the sensors, we have visible, uh, we have uh, so near infrared, visible surface temperature, LIDAR right in the middle there. And then a bunch of weather data. So we have like surface temperature and ambient temperature as well. So we we're hoping to do some, you know, like evapotranspiration with that. Okay. This particular model also, you can slide out the LIDAR mount and we have a mount for a cuvette. So you can put it in there and do liquid spectroscopy. Like I said, we're trying to make this sort of like your own, you know, personal little science station here, if you will. Uh, and there's no reason you couldn't point this up at the sky as well. And we're looking at uh, putting an AQ sensor on here as well. So, you know, with like fire haze and so on and so forth, you know, you could do some fun atmospheric measurements. So, a whole lot of things going on. Okay. Uh, and I think that's about the end of my intro. I'll go ahead and pop up the, uh, the site if it is already up there. Mike, you have a lot of questions in that box I'd like to ask you if possible. Well, uh, sure, I suppose I can field one or two. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm good until two o'clock. At two o'clock, I have a hard out because I have to go pick up my Okay, um, let me see where we begin here. Um, soldering skills, are they needed? Um, do you have to have a background in soldering in order to put this together? Uh, no, I would say not. Uh, you mean, it definitely wouldn't hurt to check out a YouTube video or two to, you know, how to solder properly and all that. Uh, Adafruit really puts out a, uh, a good video on the basics of, uh, of proper soldering and all that. But uh, I would say, no, not really. Okay. And one of our colleagues in Argentina, Anna, is really interested in, in one and she'd like to buy one. Are there different costs associated with the three different variations? Definitely. So uh, the Stella Q is going to be a little bit less, generally speaking. Um, the rest of them obviously are going to be a little bit more. I'd say the 2.0 is actually a little bit less than the 1.1 1 .1, um, at the moment, but they do fluctuate obviously with like you know the chip shortage and various other things. 
we've had to do some work around, but uh, generally speaking, we've tried to make it as, you know, the, the parts as accessible as possible. And if you can't find something, uh, again, that's kind of what the GitHub is for, and we'll be checking that out as well. Uh, but uh, last I've checked again, we're, so uh, I should mention another thing that we're doing is we were building actually 40 of these at the moment. Um, uh, we have two interns that are building them right now, uh, and it, pretty much I've been sitting with every day this over the summer, and there will be loaning them out. So I have a, like a huge list of Stella enthusiasts that I've uh, sort of collected over many different you know events and so on and so forth: scientists, engineers, farmers, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and basically, I have about 500 of them, and we're looking to loan them out for about oh, six months at a time. Uh, a case of two of them each in each case. And if you if you um, are interested in having some international partners um, pilot them, how do they get how do they go about getting in contact or being on that list? Uh, uh, contact me directly, uh, you know, and we'll see what we can do. You know, uh, obviously that is a little bit harder. I know we've already got someone in Greece who's looking to, to build some uh, and I know I met uh, a few folks from American Samoa as well. Uh, you know, obviously that's not international, but you know, so. Uh, Can you pop your email in the chat, Mike? I don't want to give that out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's unlisted. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Get it up there. And and we do understand that our our colleague Kristen Weaver is going to be taking one to the Globe Annual Partner Meeting. She um, has one, yeah. And uh, actually, I should also mention that the astronaut candidate school, ASCAN, uh, from and Allison Widener, uh, they have acquired six uh, and trained the astronauts uh, for on Earth science using them. Um, and uh, they liked it so much that her and Karen Saint Germain actually bought some for themselves. Uh, that we created, uh, you know, if we do it, it's going to be a bit more expensive, but, you know, uh, and we need the funds anyway. So, yeah. Uh, so here's my email and then let me put a link to the page. So you all can take a look at the page. Um, Brian actually went ahead and put a, the link to the Landsat Stella page in there. Okay. You did. Sweet. Uh, yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for Ryan for doing that. Um, a question from Jeff is how do you plug in Stella? How does it connect? Okay. It's got a USB-C for the 1.1 uh, because it's using the uh, Adafruit 2040 chip. Uh, the 2.0 is a micro USB, so it's all USB ports, generally speaking. Um, and that's because it uses a slightly different chip. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the 2.0 also has like a, like a tilt monitor and some other various fun things in there as well. Uh, so. And then um, uh, Joanne asked, um, does it come with a downloadable app? Because um, she really liked to have their students uh, build one. Oh yeah, well the the it doesn't have a downloadable app, but the uh, the the data viewer that I showed up there that's a mobile app that you can anyone can access. Again, we're trying to make it as convenient as possible. Uh, you can download all the files to build it, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and the software is free as well. It's also written in Circuit Python because, again, we're trying to make it as accessible as possible so people can uh, learn some programming. I should also mention some fun features on here. It's got a universal mount uh, that we built into it uh, so you can put it on a tripod. It's also got a half inch aperture so you can put it on a dowel rod and do canopy measurements. Uh, again, our engineer is unreal. Um, and so uh, <laughs> he's a fantastic guy. Uh, and then there's also uh, some other like 3D print parts, like there's a, uh, I guess it would be a sort of a baffle, which basically helps it sit like 10 centimeters above whatever you're looking at and gives you sort of the conical profile of uh, what you would be taking measurements of at that, at that height. And it's completely open on one side, so you can get those measurements. And one of the things that we're looking to do is basically one, develop a protocol for, uh, you know, taking these measurements and all that, and then two, making an amateur spectral library. So our beginning step with that is that our lead scientist, Dr. Petra Campbell, is going to make some idealized, uh, basically uh, Stella idealized uh, spectral, uh, you know what I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> spectral signatures, uh, so that we can do some fun comparison. So if someone wanted to look at, you know, like concrete and compare it with our idealized version, you know, versus theirs, you know, they could do so. Same thing with asphalt, grass, you know, various other things, you know, tomato plant, you know, 
So love, and, love the engineering, how you thought of everything, not just that handheld spectrometer, but you know, all the different things you can put it on. Uh, it, also has, it, it, it also has a belt clip. That was that was my one of my contributions to it. So I'm very proud of that, you know. So basically, like I like to call it sort of like the the scientist tape measure, if you will, you know, because it can literally be that, you know, sort of a thing, and it'll be your first, you know, collection of data, you know, and then obviously, you know, translating, you know, how you know uh, we collect data and all that sort of stuff. You can't you can't beat the hands-on experience. You can explain until you're blue in the face, you know. Like I do with Landsat and all that, but until someone actually goes out and is like, "Oh, I see how this is coming in," and then they, you know, check out the NIR and it really starts to click, you know, you can't beat that. Oh, we have a couple more questions, and I know there's there's a lot more in the chat box. I see they keep coming, so if we run out of time, if you can just look through the chat box. No, no, no. Uh, okay, so I gotta look through the chat box. No, um, I mean we can still ask, but I know you're oh, short. No, no. Time. Yeah, no, no, I, I, we're we're good with time. I have I have at least another like 15, 20 minutes left. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, one question was, I mean, we know there's different versions of phones. You have Android, you have iPhone, then you have you know these these uh different ones for different countries, and you know um how how many phones can it can it work with, and are, is it um backwards compatible with? As long as it has Bluetooth, right now, so it's using the blue uh the Blue Fruit app to actually just show the data, the your ART data, but again. It's collected on the SD card right now. So, but there's no reason you couldn't sync up, say, the time with your phone, with you know the data that you're getting, and say get you know like your you know GPS coordinates, uh, you know, or and your you know a lot of phones have lidar now, so we're looking at you know tying in with that, you know, all that sort of fun stuff. So, again, you know, developing that program is you know where it comes in. So, um, one question is um, yeah, you mentioned your, global observer photos. Yeah, so. and there's a question about how to be how to become one of your interns. Uh, we have a uh, somebody who's interested. Again, I, that's what I told my that's what I told my interns is like they are going to be the envy of every other intern out there because literally within the first six days they had a master's class worth of knowledge just chucked at them and they were I mean they they they're doing fantastic though it's they're great. Um, there's one long question here. Um, let me just read it very quickly. Just an aside here. I attended a workshop called SWUG, Space Weather Underground at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, in which we built magnetometers measuring aurora. The workshop brought in K-12 grade teachers. We built the devices ourselves, and she loved it. We got to keep them and bring them home, gathering data for the aurora, aurora scientists. You might want to consider putting together a class for teachers. Yeah, and in fact, that's that's kind of the one of the fun things that we're doing. We just actually, you know, uh, so, and that's, Part of the learner uh, program. So our team is relatively small, and again, funding is always a concern. So, uh, you know, part of the loaner program is sort of a you know quick pro pro. Hey, you get the loaner, but we would like you know the information how you know how to perform so on and so forth. Did you develop any you know sort of curricula stuff like that with it? Um, and in fact, we just sent out uh, uh, and it was a special case because it was uh, uh, for America View, and they have a whole bunch of professors and all that. Uh, and I know uh, Peter is involved with them, um, but uh, we sent out six to Britt Niantis. And, uh, and so he's actually, he's like, hey, you know, I'll develop some curriculums for you know, around this whole thing and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, so that's what we're looking to do is actually, you know. Awesome, and thank then, you. Uh, and then if you check out the GitHub, I did put on some, again, some sort of uh, different tiered uh, sort of experiments or activities that people can do with these uh, stellas. Yeah, well, th there's Joanne giving you a thumbs up because that's exactly what she wanted to hear. <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I, go, ahead. go ahead. All right. Uh, so I was going to say that, like, the, so the impetus for this whole thing is that I do like a intro to remote sensing sort of 101. Uh, in about five to 10 minutes, usually at the booths, where I do a slow boil from, you know, uh, you know, just the way light works and all that, uh, you know, additive versus subtractive color. Uh, and then I take it all the way up uh, to see, you know, like uh, how NIR is being reflected off of the leaves and all that, uh, and, you know, what that means for us. Uh, and then uh, just translate that, you know, and it goes through a whole like, you know, spectral signature sort of, uh, things so that people can really be like, you know, get that sort of understanding. So, and it seems like a, a lot of people really, you know, get their heads turned when you start bringing up agriculture, 
you know, uh, as soon as I bring up agriculture, it's usually the parents or the kids that really start to dive in and like, oh, you can start to see, you know, health of vegetation from space. Well, then you could probably do this or that or this. I'm like, yeah, that's what we're doing. We've been doing it for so long. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, two last questions before I get to the comment that um, Emmanuel wrote. Um, the battery life, the, the battery, how long is a life? Um, uh, the, the bigger battery, uh, this guy, I believe, is about 12 to 13 hours, generally speaking. The smaller one is like four to five hours. Okay, but that one's more for like, a, again, that one would be better for like drones and stuff like that. And it actually does tuck right into the sensors here. I don't know if you can see that uh, between these sensors here. It's designed to do that. So. Okay. And um, last question is, um, if the, you know, if our, our colleagues buy the Stella um, and then you come up with some new functionality of it, is that something that they could go in with their version and, and upgrade as well? Generally speaking, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, this thing is very modifiable. So if, like, if you do come up with something that new or if we come up with something new, we try to put out a, a thing about it. So. One of the things that I've been doing with the Stella enthusiasts and all that, uh, those who signed up, is basically every now and again doing like a, a webinar where we go through with what's latest and greatest, you know, what we're doing with Stella, how things with like calibration and validation are coming along. So our whole team sort of goes around and tells what's going on with Stella, what we're looking forward to doing, and all that sort of stuff. Jeff asked last, I keep saying last question, but we keep getting them. Um, how do you sign up to be a Stella enthusiast? Just email or yeah, for the most part right now, that's the, you know, pretty much the easiest way. But yeah, when I, uh, when I do it at events and all that, you know, I have a nice little sign up sheet. Yeah. So. Gotcha. And, and Peter put in the, the GitHub page. So that's another place to, for folks. That's to is also a fantastic thing. And, you know, we definitely would appreciate, you know, any questions. Basically we want to really open the floodgates on, on the GitHub page. It's been cracked, but, you know, we, we need some more people, you know, flooding it with, you know, ideas and thoughts and activities and so on and so forth so gotcha well once again thanks a lot mike thank you for joining us our, our last comment yeah. is um uh emmanuel said that he uh loved your use on boat uh, pose at the beginning of your slide so you know that was pretty <laughs> awesome <laughs> thank you thank you so so thanks and uh, like i said if people have more questions maybe you can look through the chat box before you have to head out okay sounds good thanks and with that we'll turn over to peter uh so peter it's all yours <laughs> Thanks, uh, Peter. I want. I, I just kind of wanted to uh, help us make this connection because um, you know everything that we're doing here in, with, in our um, specific uh, trees around the globe student research campaign. Fundamentally, we're measuring light, right? Like, and and I think that's one of those things that's really important to to think about. What are we actually measuring? And I'll highlight, you know, it, it, as as Mike alluded to, you know, remote remote sensing is all about making these measurements without actually touching things. And so you're talking about something that is hard to touch, hard to visualize, hard to understand. Um, and and so I'm I am excited as a as an educator as as somebody who uses you know this sort of technology um, in in my science to have a way of actually talking to people about it. So you know this it, it, this tool it really isn't anything different than what we've been doing for a long time. And in fact, a lot of teachers have already been using a form of this type of instrument um, in the past whenever they talk about remote sensing. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, we have the education lessons, we even have the vocabulary here in the GLOBE program to talk about this. And, um, and I think one of the things that it does open up is the ability to do experimentations in the classroom that connect up to the same measurements that are getting made up in space um, um, or that are actually getting made by people's mobile devices, um, you know, um, through GLOBE Observer. Again, you know, this is all remote sensing. It's all about reflected light. And so that's really a, a key piece here is when you're talking about physics or when you're talking about photosynthesis um, or when you're talking about chemistry even, you can bring Stella in to help people understand that uh, measurement that, that NASA makes, which is that, you know, wavelengths um, and, and how things respond to it. Um, so as I highlighted, it's really important to go back to that tour of the electromagnetic spectrum because that is foundational to understanding what the heck Stella is actually measuring.
Okay, I think that's really crucial because numbers are, are mean different things. Um, and, and here we want people to understand that light measurements are a measurement. It has units with it. And, um, and, and here Stella measures in watts per square, uh, per meter squared. Um, and, and so, you know, there is this fundamental piece uh, of it. And, um, and, and that's a really important part. And as we, you, one of the things that, that, that we have the ability to do here in the GLOBE program is to, you know, not just quantum, not just make these measurements of, um, this is the number that I'm getting, right? Like, you know, this example here where, okay, you have these numbers, but what do they mean? And why are you getting them? And that all goes back to the surface that we're measuring. But importantly, it also goes down to what the atmosphere is like and where the sun is at at the time I make this measurement. Okay, so it's it, it it really isn't good enough to just make a measurement and report that measurement. What do those numbers mean? I mean, Mike was kind of showing that earlier. Great, you can make your graph, but what is it that you're measuring? And this is where the Globe Observer land cover tool really comes in because you should be doing these things coincidentally. So at the same time, so you actually have a picture of the thing that you were measuring. Because again, your mobile device is it, when you take a digital image with your camera to do a globe observer observation, uh, you are actually measuring um, your blue, green, red wavelengths, just like Stella is doing here. So one of the things to remember is that this pavement that I'm measuring with Stella, Yes, there's a, there, there's a lot more measurements that are being made with this sensor. There is a violet, there is a blue, there is a green, there is a yellow, there's an orange, there's red. And then you get into all these things that we can't measure with our mobile devices. Um, and um, and those are those those near infrared wavelengths and measurements that Mike was alluding to earlier that help us to understand the health of plants and what is actually happening outside of what our camera can record, okay? So, you know, but the great thing is our mobile devices can do a sample of what Stella records. So what I mean by that is the blue light that you are measuring when you take a, an image with your camera is similar to the blue light that is being measured by Stella. Same thing with the green light, it, you know, is being measured there. And same thing with the red light. And so we, when you, when you have a student do a digital image, you're actually making similar measurements as Stella. It's just that we're only able to measure three of the wavelengths and Stella, because of the sensors that Mike was showing us earlier, it's able to break that sunlight into a lot more wavelengths and, me and therefore be able to make different measurements. One of the things that I really like about Stella is that not only are you getting the, the, the spectral wavelengths that are coming off of this, but I think importantly, we're getting a surface temperature measurement. And that is really important as we start thinking about, you know, what is the importance of making of a, 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 a using Globe Observer to make a photo, take a photo, take a measurement of um, that pavement. Well, one thing that we can do is, is we can use the Stella measurement here of 41 degrees surface temperature. That's really warm, 41 degrees um, Celsius here. If other students don't have a Stella, but they're able to make, um, to, to record the photos of what's in that location, we can actually start putting together the Stella wavelengths together with the photos. And that is exactly what, what scientists are doing, is they take a spot measurement, just like what I'm doing here, and they can associate these other numbers with this black pavement that's there. We can also go to other surface measurements and go to the opposite side. And here you can see, you know, Stella can, it, it, those, those sensors can measure highly reflective surfaces like our, our snow or areas that, that are not just clean surfaces, but a mix of, of things. Here we have dirt on top of snow, which changes those measurements. And again, you know, if you don't happen to have Stella, but all you have is this photo behind it, 
if we have that library of measurements of, of coincident measurements like this, we can we can extrapolate from these points where we're making our measurements to other locations that have a similar ground photo to this. And that's exactly what satellites are what, what scientists are doing when they are using satellite measurements. Satellite uh, uh, satellite measurements really are just lots of these individual measurements put together in a systematic way. Okay, so one thing I've been doing is going around and not only recording the Stella measurements here, but I've been using my Globe Observer land cover tool and the Globe Observer clouds tool to both do to 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 make measurements not only of the ground that I'm measuring or the feature that I'm measuring with Stella, but importantly, what the sky conditions are like. Is there smoke in the sky? Is there clouds in the sky? Um, where is that sun angle at that moment when I'm making this observation? Those are really important things to 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 record with these measurements, and um, and 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 so I just kind of want to I've I've been going around making these these coincident measurements myself, including hot springs, and um, and and hot water. One of the other things you may not think about is. It's not only the ground surface, um, but it's also the color of things like tree bark or the rocks in that area that actually make up that Stella measurement that you are making. And so when uh, by, by, by us as a community doing a lot of rapid measurements with our globe observer, um, uh, both in the photos as well as um, telling us about what's on the ground or what's in the sky, these stellar measurements actually take on real meaning. And, um, and that's exactly what we're seeing when we start going to um, different things like all of the satellite measurements that you see from space. And, you know, the big thing here is that these satellites are just seeing more ground than what you're able to do when you are standing there making your own Stella measurement. Um, when you're when you are doing your Stella measurements, like I was I was showing here, basically you are measuring about a one meter area on the ground, um, and um, and so as you change that elevation of your of that measurement as it goes up further into space the area that you're measuring starts getting more reflected light into it, okay? So that's where it really does matter um, what is, not only what you're measuring here, but what is surrounding it and how does the light bounce off of that to illuminate it in the way that you see when you take a digital image of that. So, um, you know, it, what, what, what's really important is that there's a lot of things out here that we've highlighted in past webinars that we've just kind of talked about. Spectral bands are one of these things that we've talked a lot about. And this is, this is sort of the graphic of what Mike and his team are, are trying to help us um, measure on the ground. We have the visible wavelengths over on the left-hand side. And then we have some of that, that the, the short wave um, information that is, again, measured by satellites because they cost a lot of money um, and they have the sensors to do that, but they're also able to measure that surface temperature. And, uh, and, and, the, and the relationship between the surface temperature and what we're, what we're measuring in the globe community is related. And that's a, a big reason why I'm excited about about getting more of the Stella out into the community because um, one of the things that we that 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 we do a lot is we show satellite imagery to, to students to ourselves, and the key there is that what we are showing or what we're seeing in those satellite images relate back to those wavelengths that we're measuring and how the land cover reacts to it. Right. So as we start to bend our own minds and start to look at the uh, at the world around us using these spectral measurements, using the sunlight measurements like this, it really we really have to understand those wavelengths and what is it that we're measuring and how do they come together? And that's what Stella really allows us to do. And and so I'd highlight. There's been 50 years of research that has been going into understanding what 
what do you use to measure certain things? Okay, so yes, Stella can measure um, all, all, a lot of different light reflection or absorption. And I think one, one of the things that I think is kind of exciting is, is the ability to actually start doing spectral measurements in your classroom. And so you can actually look at, well, what is the effect spectrally across you know, these different measurements when um, a, a, a tree seedling doesn't get enough water? And so you can actually do that experiment in the classroom where you um, uh, control and you make daily measurements using Stella here, and you can actually deprive one of those uh, uh, seedlings or, or trees or plants from water. And you can see what the spectral response is. And the reason why that's important is because we have from space a, a, a variety of sensors that we can actually already understand. And this is what Mike was saying is, not only do we want you to record Stella or record the spectra measurements, but we actually need to know what is, it, what is it that we're measuring. So in this case, if you go out and you measured dry grass, we would expect you to see, uh, you know, something along, you know, that looks something like this. It would have this kind of shape to it, and the and 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 the and the key is, what is it that uh, that you are actually seeing in your area? And you know, when we actually start to bring in, um, say, water and look at water or some other things like that, right? So this spectral profile as we call it, is, is a way that we can identify different features um, and different um, things on, on Earth. And, um, and this is, this is the, the basic thing that we need measurements of these wavelengths on the ground so that we can understand what the satellite is, is actually showing us. So that's the big idea here. And, um, and, and I'm really excited to work with other GLOBE partners um, and teachers who are collecting this information. And, um, and there will be a difference between measurements inside of a classroom versus measurements outside when you are maybe doing other globe measurements like tree height. Um, and, and so, you know, again, it's really important to, to think about where that light is coming from when you are making these measurements. Um, and, and, and and what might be happening between the sun and the thing that you're actually measuring on the ground. So that's a little bit, that, that's, that's, I really wanted to kind of take us through and show you that there, within the GLOBE community, measuring wavelengths, measuring light has been a foundational piece of what we've been doing from the very beginning. And, um, and it's really important to start connecting not only the atmospheric protocols and measurements, um, but to but also connecting those um, those measurements to what we're measuring using remote sensing tools like Stella or Globe Observer. I know we've got some we've got a lot of uh, uh, of great. Uh, questions and conversations here about what we might be able to actually do with this. So I don't want I don't want to keep going on myself because um, it is really exciting this possibility. But I, I I think one of the things that that we that that is happening here is you we have the ability to have some students who are engineering focused build these sensors and get that. And then we have another group of students who are interested in just going out and making the measurements. And then we have a whole other group of students who now need a way of seeing, of gathering and organizing those measurements once they're made. And this is something that I think the GLOBE community can really help um, uh, Mike and his team with, which is building that spectral library. So as you use Stella, don't just uh, uh, make those measurements by themselves, but also use Globe Observer to record what you are measuring. And again, you know, to capture that, that the, the clouds and the sun at that moment in time. All of that's really important when we do the cloud match um, or the satellite match to even the ISAT-2 or many of the other um, uh, 
satellite matches that we have. And so how does that one meter down photo that you're collecting with Globe Observer relate to the satellites? It is through this exercise that we're really excited to be able to um, expand that sensor in your pocket from just the, gr the blue, green, red wavelengths that we have with the photo to all of this other information that we can get. So I know I talked over, you know, Mike has, uh, I think had to leave us now, um, but uh, I know for me, this this tool is, is what the Globe community has been waiting for, um, for a long time to move from the physical touching and physical measurements into the science of remote sensing. So let's have a little conversation here about uh, what people are thinking about doing, how all of the, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about in our, uh, you know, Trees Around the Globe student research campaign, how could they come together through all of these different things that we've been measuring? I, I don't see anything in the chat box yet, um, Peter. I know, I stumped um, everybody, Peter. <laughs> uh, but as I see, if, if things start coming through, I will uh, let you know. And if somebody wants to unmute and start talking, that's fine as well. Um, sorry, could you like um, say the question again? So sorry. Yeah. So, so, so Jeff, we, we're really just kind of curious, like, I know you're one of those, those students who are interested in using this and, and working with a Stella instrument. And I think, you know, again, the big thing here is that Stella is the name of the instrument, just like Modus is like the name of like, you know, um, or, or, or that kind of thing is like, you know, we have the name of the, the, the unit and on that unit, there are a lot, there are particular sensors. There are, um, you know, it, there, there was this, you know, it, this desire to add on a LIDAR um, so that we can actually know how high off the ground you're making that measurement, um, as well as be able to profile it in the same way that we've talked about here. Uh, so there is a lot of analog between those measurements in space or, you know, the, the, the remote sensing measurements and what we're trying to do here, um, and and so I think you know one of the one of the things that you saw is I actually specifically asked this group to make it possible to um, use Globe Observer with your with your Stella measurements, and so you you know that was the reason why you actually got that that um, the mobile device on top of the Stella instrument, so that you can take that down image and get the imagery that goes along with those measurements. So um, that's what we're hoping that people will do. And I think one thing that, that um, I, I am gonna put forward is, you know, next week at the Globe Annual Meeting, as Brian alluded to, um, there's gonna be a demonstration of Stella that's there. Um, I, as, as, as Mike Taylor was, was mentioning, there is, you know, how, we uh, what is the protocol for using this is the question and to me we have a protocol already in place and that is called the globe observer land cover tool or globe observer clouds and really those two are connected together so what i'm hoping is that af after next week after uh, people get a chance to see this in action make some measurements and that kind of thing that our trees are on the globe student research campaign will come back and talk specific protocols and research that you can do with the Stella tool. I've already, you know, kind of mentioned there's there's a variety of in-classroom activities that you can use to experiment around to see um, what might be a limiting factor for that tree growth, right? Brian keeps, you know, asking us that question of like, well, um, are, are that is that how tall those trees are going to grow in that area? And and we've talked a lot about limiting factors of droughts or water, um, soil, um, nutrients, all kinds of things like that. And Stella gives you a way of starting to experiment around with that so that when you look to the satellite measurements, 
and scientists say there's a drought in this area, you can also, you will have recorded a similar profile of that, in, you know, in your classroom. And, and you can also experiment around what happens with when you overwater something or, you know, and so there's, there's a lot of in-class um, experimentation that will help the satellite imagery just make a lot more sense, um, you know, to, to everybody. And, um, and so I just kind of wanted to really put that out there that I think in August, you know, for, for us, we would be interested in finding out who has a Stella who ends up making one of these, right? Um, and then also, if you don't have a Stella, how can we support you in the data analysis or, you know, working with the data that comes out of it, which is, you know, a lot of what we do here is we work with the data that comes off the, off the satellites. Many of us are not the ones who are actually collecting the data. We're not the engineers. We're not the ones calibrating, right? So there's a whole group of, uh, of us that, that can start thinking about the data and analyzing the data and what are those numbers that we're actually getting back and that kind of thing. You know, there's, there's a comment um, from Joanna. She says, one, she really likes the way you, you made connections with everything, um, how you connected the relevance of using the app with the Stella uh, to clarify, you know, what salads are seen. And she said, she's like, I must have one. So she's really sold on Stella. Um, <laughs> my question is, so are you envisioning, um, you know, our partners, our, our teachers, students using Stella to do uh, research for perhaps like a, a research projects um, and what variables uh, should they be using to make connections between, you know, the globe observer um, uh, protocols and uh, satellite observations. Because sometimes it's one thing to have something like this, but there's so much there. Uh, teachers often think like, this is awesome. How do I use it? How do I make connections? Yeah, Peter, you were exactly right on that. Um, and, you know, and so, so, you know, for me, the, there's, there's the easy thing th um, that teachers can, um, if you're already doing any of the globe um, protocols, any of the globe uh, measurements, it's really easy to just add in a Stella measurement into that and record the, the extra spectral numbers that you get at that. And, um, and what you'll start to see is that even throughout the same day at the same spot, you will have some differences because that sun angle is casting more shadow or it's changing illumination as it goes through. So to me, that's an easy way that, that people can, if you get, if you can have a Stella, it's just another set of numbers that you add in. But I, I, I was really excited about uh, a few years ago when I was first start when we were first starting the Globe Observer land cover piece. One of, one of the parts that we know that we're able to see with our spectral measurements is photosynthesis change, that greenness change. And, um, and, and that's something that you actually see in the digital imagery as well. Um, you can actually see when trees are stressed, they, or they start, the, the green actually goes down. Stella gives us a way of starting to think about what are those things that might affect photosynthesis, okay? And so we know the amount of red light is an important thing for photosynthesis. So you can start playing around actually with um, the amount of red light and um, that a plant gets in a classroom. And you can have, you know, set up an experiment where you have one plant that is uh, photosynthesizing and, um, and has just um, a regular amount of light. And then you can set up another one and add in like red lights or blue lights or other things like that. There's, and, and that piece of it is where you can start to see the difference between photosynthesis by um, species um, and, or, um, or again, sometimes the amount of carbon dioxide you can actually add into um, a, you know, a, a, an area that you are um, growing a plant in. So you know, really kind of starting to break down those things that make a plant <laughs> photosynthesize and, and live and actually be able to hit that greatest height potential. <laughs> right? Um, soil moisture, uh, water availability, nutrients, different nutrient amounts, 
um, it really allows you to to bring in that soil protocol that you know we 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 talk a lot about or that is really important in agriculture but it can be a really hard thing to make that connection between the soil protocols that you're measuring and the spectral measurements that you get so i really like when you do a soil uh, 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 a protocol if you actually also do a, a stella measurement and you that 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 ground measurement you are actually able to connect to the soil moisture moisture active passer passive satellite and that that soil moisture piece of things um, because dry soil um, actually reflects differently than wet soil and this is something that really came out in that um, it, by using that particular sensor so just using the globe protocols to characterize what's there and then using a stellar measurement um, to identify it spectrally that's what scientists do and um, and i'm going to share my screen again because this is one of one of the uh, uh one of the things that that we actually you'll notice um, if we go back to kind of our, our spectral library here, when I go to our sensors and target, you might not be able to see what's on this because of the way that the, 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 the browser um, works or, or sharing. Um, but we actually, you know, have some different, um, you know, moisture levels um, actually will change that the numbers that you get back in Stella. And so, so um, one of the things that you'll notice when we you have these reference spectra is that you notice there's dry grass. Well, there's also wet grass inside of there, and that again will have a different profile, just like you know, kind of this juniper has a different profile than the dry grass. And this, this to me again has been a hard thing. To, to connect a globe measurement, say soil moisture, to this satellite measurement. And which one do you use? And what do you use? How do you actually understand it? And a lot of times it is when you're able to make 12 to 15 individual spectral measurements like this, that you're able to make the distinction between um, your juniper trees versus like dry grass or even the other type of trees that are out there like for instance i'll add in maple trees and and so even though here you know you there's a you this is what you start getting with stellar is just a lot of different numbers and a lot of different profiles and it's just it, why you're getting that profile goes back to all of those globe measurements that we're, that we're, that we're making. Soil moisture, um, leaf area. Um, what, what is the atmosphere like? Is there um, uh, clouds in the sky or not clouds in the sky? And, um, and I'll tell you, uh, and, and I wanted to take you here to, um, you know, here is a demonstration of me just kind of doing a stellar measurement. Right, and I think one thing that that I want to I want to highlight that Mike alluded to here, it is incredibly important to record how high off the ground is this sensor, and that goes back into this field of view. That's what that FOV stands for, the field of view. So, how much of the ground is this instrument able to actually see? And you know, and so here I'm just gonna I'm gonna pause it because I found it can be really hard to read this out in the sunlight because the 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 screen will reflect the sunlight itself. Um, so a pro tip here I've actually found is that I I will actually take a picture of my Stella measurements so that I have a record of that as well as um, touching the button here so that I can um, put it into the visualizer. Um, but I like these two things. And one thing, again, there is a unit here. Um, so you have the, the, the um, watts per meter squared. Okay, so you actually have a unit of measurement that you're making here. That's crucial. 
And then you also hear, you know, the nice thing is I have a spot measurement for um, this asphalt was measured at 42 degrees Celsius. The air temperature, which is different, was only measured at 31 degrees Celsius. So the, 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 the exciting piece is that you can use this number to model out how hot your community is. All you need to know is how much asphalt there is in your community. And then you can multiply that by this, uh, you know, the 42 degrees Celsius, and that's how much area uh, you would expect to be this temperature. And, and so, you know, you go underneath a tree canopy, you'll get a different uh, surface temperature measurement right here. And I like that you don't have to have multiple instruments to do this. It's all in one place. You add in the, the photo of, of that measurement as well. And you then have the, all the information you need to start understanding the surface temperature and how things like the trees or tree canopy might be affecting surface temperature, air temperature, and being able to describe your community. So I like to do those videos so that I have all of that information with me. That's awesome. We have a, a couple more questions for you, Peter. Um, first from uh, Joanne, she asked, um, when she, she knows that we really appreciate data from pretty much anywhere, everywhere, the more data we have, the better. But yep. is there any area, a uh, particular focus that you would like to get received data from? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so so the reason why I, I went up and kind of showed this uh, series of images is that um, we are interested in um, getting examples of all of the, the the main land cover types that are in your area, right? So um, knowing uh, or, or having measurements of your asphalt, having measurements of your concrete, having measurements of um, all of the, the built surfaces, that's what we're going for here. Um, and, and one of the things to, like I said, to always think about is being consistent with the time that you're taking these measurements. Um, because that sun angle is, the, is, is going to affect these numbers. So if you have a class that goes out at three or you know, that goes out at 9 a.m., don't expect to have the same numbers at three in the afternoon. Okay, so that timing is another reason why we have a consistency with our satellite observations as well. So, um, so you know, going out and um, having a, a group that does the land cover photos and does that land cover piece of things describes that is, you know, really what we're looking for. And, uh, and we want to have as much variation in our measurements as possible, meaning that um, we, I expect that at different latitudes, as you go further north or further south, we're going to be getting different measurements because of that sun angle is different over time. And, um, and this is a, a great way to have students actually make a connection between earth and sun and the, how the, the different seasons happen is you will actually have a different illumination number here in that same place in June than you will in December, okay? And, um, and, 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 and this is a great way to just track a location over time. Um, and, and, the, and the reason why I say that is because the, that solar elevation here, I just clicked on a, on a location, but, this, you know, depending on the t the day of the year in the north, you have a, just a lot more illumination depending on when you're making this measurement. So uh, one of the things that, that we're interested here is to make that connection between green up, the date of green up, the sun angle, and how fast that green up occurs. And that's something that you can use with Stella to, to make those measurements. And it's not just the, the, that, that overstory canopy that we're interested in, um, but it really is, uh, you know, kind of going back. Here's an example where you have yellow because it's flowering. And you, so you'll have a spike in the yellow at this time of year. 
Um, and so getting when plants are flowering is a really good one. Um, and then you'll also, if you go back later, you'll have more green at a different time of year. One of the other things that you're, get, that you're also measuring with Stella is the amount of soil that is in there. And, and that, you know, and it's this combination that actually gives us that number. So one of the things that I also recommend, you know, is those, uh, the homogenous areas are really good. Those are really easy, they're consistent, and they make a lot of sense to us. But I'd also challenge us to go to areas where you have an assemblage of different things like this, and we call it a mixed pixel. How does that light reflection change over time? And that's exactly what you would expect to see as a, uh, as, as a tree goes through its phenology cycle through the year, right? Um, and when it greens up at the beginning of the year, it's gonna, it's gonna look one way and have certain measurements. And as it goes through its leaf life, it will actually change those numbers. So it is a more detailed way of getting at the green up and the green down. Um, and even, you know, being able to put, you know, right now we have paint chip colors that we use in the GLOBE program. Here, you can actually put those paint chip numbers to the, 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 the digital numbers that we're measuring. And it gives us actually a little bit more specificity with what we're measuring. So this is kind of, this, this to me is, is the next evolution to the GLOBE program of going kind of from those analog um, protocols that we have into um, being able to have more digital space inside of here. And, um, and I think, you know, when we are able to add on the LIDAR aspect, you will be able to simulate everything that we've been talking about over the last five years of this particular um, Trees Around the Globe student research campaign. Um, and, um, and so that analog between the satellites and what you can do in the classroom um, is here right now. And I think part of what we're, what we're doing here is we need to experiment around with the protocol with our numbers to see what are the recommendations we can make, okay? So th I think the big key is for those that take on this challenge and, and, you know, and get a stellar measurement is to, like Mike was saying, report back, share your results. And this, it really is the science of remote sensing that um, we've been talking about for 50 years. You make a measurement, and then you go to another place and you make that same measurement. Do you, do you get the same numbers? And if you don't, well, why don't you get those same numbers? That really is the bottom line of what we're doing here. Um, and, um, and this Stella sensor, like I said, I don't want people to feel left out if you don't have one. So we are going to work on helping to create that spectral library so that people and students, uh, all of us can contribute and start understanding these numbers that are coming through this new sensor that is that has been out that is uh, being developed here. And, and ultimately, you know, this all takes us to where we are trying to um, really understand um, we, and, and prepare everybody for which is the Landsat next mission okay um and I, I i part of the reason why stella came around and why it's really useful is because it's helping us with our landsat next calibration and thinking about not just the four wavelengths that we were talking about before but plan on having many more sat uh, satellite uh, wavelength measurements and so, you know, you can see this is where we're going with our science. And Stella is a, a great way for us to start understanding wavelengths on, on those, in those spectral measurements and how they relate to our globe measurements. Okay, so let us know if you are interested in getting a, a Stella, if you are interested in um, working with the numbers, um, 
we there's a lot of different ways of being involved here from the engineering all the way up to the data management and side of things so don't feel that you have to have that instrument to be involved or um, to help us understand how to use this together with our globe measurements that we've been doing with the trees around the globe student research campaign brian yeah w one last question for you um Please. for jeff he says um um, he's interested in helping to build Stella sensors and engineering parts. Um, wait, he asked one more question. Let me look, look up, go up again. Um, da, 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 students, um, where did it go? I see my chat box is kind of going all over. I know, <laughs> went along. Yeah, I, I guess that was it. Um, I, I see. Oh, I have another question. Um, I oh, think those, because I have a Stellar sensor, um, but I'm not sure how to like, bring up the graph that um Brian showed, I think. Yeah, yeah, so so Jeff, um, luckily I, I know we've got another way. Uh, um, so you and I will have, a, we'll follow up together about um, how to get data off of the Stella. Um, you know, for me, you know, there's two ways. One is to actually do that transfer, and, you know, plug it in. The other way is to take a picture of that measurement, just like what I was showing you on the screen there. And then, you know, just type that into a spreadsheet. Um, and so I personally don't want to um, lose the concepts by getting hung up in that transfer piece, that technology piece, right? So, um, so, so Jeff, let's, we'll follow up with, with how to kind of move the data off because that is a place where what is easiest? Um, there's experimentation here um, that we, we're still trying to kind of figure out. And as Mike alluded to, Mike Taylor alluded to earlier, what is the best format for building up the, up the spectral library? And um, and, and and so um, Jeff, you do need uh, you basically it, it comes with a USB, or you, you all you need is a USB C or USB micro USB cord. You plug that in, and then you go to the Stella visualization website. And it should all kind of uh, um, be recognized at that point. But this is one of those those documentation things that um, the GitHub site is a great place to ask that kind of question too. So I want to encourage everybody here. We're not Stella experts. There's really no Stella expert out there, um, and that's why we're using the GitHub community forum as a place to crowdsource and to contribute and to be part of this community. Okay, so it goes under the, the umbrella of NASA's open science, open data is this is a place where, you, you know, um, if you come up with a better way of doing things or add a, something on a new way of, of, of analyzing the data, share it through the GitHub site. And that's the place that we're trying to have that open conversation so that people can contribute and they can understand. Um, and so no matter what age you are um, or where you are at, we want engineers, we want data scientists, and we need people contributing to this new sensor data set. And, and the last question uh, before uh, we, we go back to Brian, and I actually have to run to another meeting as well. Um, before you got here, Peter, um, Emmanuel was talking about, um, he, he had planted some trees and he wanted to know, you know, to, to measure the height and be able to see, you know, how they're doing, if they're healthy. And you yep. talked about a lot of variables to measure to, to, that ties into the health of these trees. And I yeah. thought that was key. And I just wanted to connect you with what Emmanuel was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's a lot of variables that you mentioned that he can probably start measuring that, exactly. that we'll talk about or help him to, to understand the height and the, the, the health of the trees that he planted. You're right. You're right on that, Peter. I mean, that to me is the is the power of the Globe program. Is there's protocols and and methods and, that have already been developed. That if if you if you spend the time and and actually use all of those protocols to measure the things, then you can um, go from those single points and use the satellite data and, and to find other places that look similar to that. And that's really the key. And so use those GLOBE protocols and use the, the, the database of the GLOBE program to organize yourself, to make it cheaper for you to actually monitor these locations. Because you're right, Peter, 
um, the, the methods are there, the, the infrastructure is there, and we just need people to make those measurements. And you, it then will reveal whether your plant is stressed or not, how fast it's growing or not. And you can, um, you, you can do these long-term monitoring projects that you need to do when you're talking about plants growing over time and trees in particular. Good point, Peter. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Peter, for answering that question. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we're going to turn it back over to Brian. Um, and I'm going to have to dip out of here because I have another meeting I have to present at. All right, Bye, Peter. Thank, thank you, Peter. And thank you, Peter. And uh, yeah, um, if there are any more questions, you know, feel free to pop those in the chat. If not, uh, we can adjourn because we are at, um, you know, at the time of, for the webinar. So uh, if anybody has any last minute uh, questions, please either unmute or pop them in the chat. And as a reminder, um, once the, the webinar ends, I will then at one point get a notification when the recording is available from Zoom, and then I will upload it to our webinar page so you all can uh, take a look at that. But I'll send an email out as per normal um, once that is done. And as you uh, as you know, Zoom, and I can receive this recording in a couple minutes to a couple hours. It all depends. So uh, any last minute questions? Joanne, go ahead. Um, Brian, I don't have a question, but I just want to thank um, all the people that are involved in this project. I think it's absolutely uh, wonderful. I I, I feel refreshed <laughs> because, um, you know, Globe has been, we've been a, a Globe school now since 1996. And that's basically, you know, when uh, Globe was at its toddler stages. And, and um, you know, I was going to inquire about, um, you know, getting some updated Landsat images. Um, I can't remember what year it says on them, but they're the original uh, images. But um, you know, especially considering um, this summer's uh, climate in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm not exactly sure what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere, but um, just having these new tools that we can share with our students and help them see, um, you know, what's going on on the planet and uh, what, you know, how can we um, help in gathering that data. And I, you know, I really thank you all for your involvement and keeping, you know, Globe moving forward in this exciting direction. And uh, I, I, I need a Stella. I need one. <laughs> I'll be your Alaska person. <laughs> That's excellent, Joy, because like, you know, uh, I will say you are in a place where sun angle changes very rapidly. Um, and um, and so actually, you know, that that piece of things, it will make it very interesting. And so, you know, I look forward to having some more conversations about that because um, I know um, there's there's just a lot of interest in in being able to quantify what's happening up there. Um, you know, and and the and the spectral piece of things really allows us to get at some of that. And so I'm 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 excited to uh, you know help support you however we can with that because um, I know you've you have some really good um, uh, land cover sites that are that actually have the changes and some things like that. So um, you know, getting ex spectral examples of those things as they change over time. Um, you know, is a great way to then help connect the students up to what we're seeing regionally and, you know, in that area too, because it is, it's really important for all of us to go from what we see that human scale first to then, you know, take that and expand it out to other places and see the scale of, you know, the uh, Alaska brown down or <laughs> brown up as it's called. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And um, anybody else? All right, then I'm going to stop uh, recording and we will see you next time. And there hasn't been a specific date um, determined yet for the August campaign webinar, but that'll be coming out shortly. Um, we have uh, some information out with some uh, scientists. So just waiting for some, uh, you know, um, conversations with them. So, you know, stay tuned for that, but also stay tuned for the recording info to come out either later today or most likely first thing tomorrow or sometime during tomorrow. I'm actually doing a, uh, basically a uh, 
half day workshop on ice set two at the NASA Wallops flight facility uh, tomorrow, uh, my home base. So um, thank you everyone. Let me go ahead and stop recording.